involves the Philadelphia Gay News. So I'm interested if you could maybe give us a couple of the critical turning points in the history of the newspaper as it evolved from being, you know, very uh, basic publication to a much larger, more different publication. Yeah. And now a mainstay of, uh, you know, Philadelphia media. Well, I'd like to. I think I'd like to use some of this time if I can talk about LGBT media and what it's been like over the last 40 years for us to get going. And I can do that fast. I have a follow-up question later. Oh, you do? What do you see coming? Okay. So the question is, how did we become what we are? Key, um, key points of the evolution. The, the earliest point of evolution was we, we had a gossip column, columnist who had said something about a gay bar. And the gay bar owner didn't like it. At which time, in gay publishing, uh, the only advertising you had, the only revenue you had, basically, was from your vending boxes or from gay advertisers. And I decided at that point, very early on, if we couldn't tell the truth, what was the use of publishing? So we decided to not retract the story, and we lost that advertiser. And we decided that at that early stage, we were going to go after all kinds of advertising, not just LGBT advertising. And uh, what that did was we became a clear voice of our community. And therefore, and we also would publish stories and op-ed pieces where people had opposite views than what we on the editorial side had. And so that's what made the paper and still does to this day. And we, I think, one more thing, we would also cover stories that nobody else would cover. I went back, one of the great things about doing this, the book was that I got to look back at 40 years in newspapers. And um, I saw the influence that GLF had on me because I could see that from the earliest versions, while most LGBT media is just beginning to cover trans issues, we covered it the first year. And a lot, not just once. We always did. Um, we were, uh, it's now cliche, but we were the first place you ever read about lesbian monks. That came from Philadelphia Gay News. Um, a lot of things that you're now beginning to see pub parties and the problem that poor trans people go through. One of the, the first story you ever saw about that was in Philadelphia Gay News. The, the AIDS bike rides that the New York Times talked about uh, and dismantled. You didn't read it in the New York Times first, you read it in Philadelphia Gay News first. Those are the kind of things we did. Um, I'm interested in the part of your evolution from um, mainly using protest tactics protest tactics to working within the system, uh, initially in Philadelphia and then more Pennsylvania-wide politics. And you were willing to invest a great deal of time in working with people who were not initially receptive to the calls of LGBT civil rights. People such as that, uh, Thatcher Longstreet, Longstreet, am I pronouncing Very good. Longstreet, on your local city council, uh, John Street, your mayor, Arnold Inspector, your senator. And that may surprise some people since you've been someone uh, so willing to to use confrontational tactics, such as being uh, using zaps and getting arrested. Uh, can you talk a bit about that part of the uh, political process? For David, you? if you see the smile on my face, it's because it's the question I've always wanted someone to ask, and you're the first one to ask. Um, yes, I'm extremely proud of that. Um, one of the things that I've always thought and believed all along is that you could have a high consciousness and you could sit on the top of the mountain and say, I got a high consciousness, you people all have to come up to me. Or you could do the other, other thing, which in my case is stretch your hand out and say, I'm willing to help you get up there. Just open your ears, listen to me, and let's dialogue. And I've done that with a good number of people. And everyone I've done that with, I've been able to bring over to the other side. Um, the first one you mentioned is Thatcher Longstreth who literally on city council floor used to refer to gay people as fairies. Um, we went to the point where he not only sponsored the gay pride resolution, he actually was the vote that gave Philadelphia domestic partners legislation. Um, the next one you mentioned was Thatcher Longstreth. I'm sorry, um, Arlen Spector. U.S. Senator Arlen Spector, most of you would know probably from the single bullet theory, uh, with the Kennedy assassination, he was the lead counsel of the Warren Commission uh, to the Anita Hill uh, hearings on the Senate. He was a Republican. Uh, what most people didn't know is that we had him in our back pocket for an LGBT vote if we needed him. And it's unveiled in the book for the first time. Uh, and there's a scene in the book where uh, I happened to kidnap the secretary of HUD. Uh, 
um, that was with Arlen Specter. Uh, uh, as my sidekick. People do some strange things when they're around me. I don't know why. Um, and then you mentioned, was he, oh, John Street. John Street. Mayor John Street was a Seventh Day Adventist. And when he uh, was city council president, he refused to pass domestic partners legislation. And he controlled his city council. And nothing ever passed that he didn't want. He didn't want domestic partners. And his best friend was Thatcher Longstreth. I got that. I got it passed through his city council with his best friend voting for it. Um, eventually, he wanted to run for mayor, and he thought his views were a little too, too over extreme, and so we started discussions. And those discussions led him to become, at that point, the most positive mayor on LGBT issues. In fact, taking that when the right wing tried to call our domestic partners law that the city passed, which he was opposed to. Um, to the Supreme Court of Pennsylvania, he used city lawyers to make sure it remained the law of the city of Philadelphia. He also spent more money in the LGBT community than in all the mayors before him. And the last one, which you didn't mention, is uh, P Tea Party Governor um, Tom yeah. Corbin. Oh, okay. Yeah, um, who in Pennsylvania uh, allowed marriage equality to become law a year before the Supreme Court. Uh, and again, it's getting to know them and talk to them and meet to them. And that story is in the book for the first time. Um, and I worked with his senior legal advisors. And he was in the middle of re-election when the court ruled the way they did in Pennsylvania. And it was his decision whether or not to appeal to the Supreme Court, at which point I gave him four ways that he could go. And because of our relationship, he decided to let marriage equality happen in Pennsylvania. And then lost re-election. Kind of an interesting story. <laughs> so, so my point being is, we have to be willing to dialogue with people, even though, even those who are not our friends, as long as they're educable. I mean, there are certain people who just aren't going to listen no matter what. All of those people who are educable. Yeah, yeah. Well, you're making me smile now. I'm thinking you work with one seventh day at Venice, so Ben Carson is Republican nominee. Maybe you would send you to talk to him. <laughs> 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 Haven't I done my things? <laughs> I don't think you have to worry about it. Uh, okay, and by cultivating so many political figures for a long time, uh, you were able, it seems to me what, one, one thing you're doing is you're playing the long game, you know? And by doing this, you're able to find ways to make the money being used for our community, uh, most notably with the nation's uh, first affordable housing design, specifically for LGBT seniors, the John Anderson Apartments in Philadelphia, a great accomplishment. And I was delighted to visit there at that building uh, when I was in Philadelphia for the 50th anniversary of the first Andrew Reminder for guests. Thank you very much. Um, if you'll indulge me, tell me a little story. Yeah. Because uh, I was delighted that uh, the first night I was there as your guest to reconnect with a very old friend of mine, John James. Uh, he is an activist back with me in Madison, Wisconsin. He actually gave me money to be able to do an AIDS work <laughs> out of his own pocket and never asked me to pay back. Uh, and um, then years later, he was the person who started uh, AIDS Treatment News. Well, I'd forgotten, maybe he told me when I knew it was constant, he was in the first Andrew Reminder, which is what we were there for. 1965. And in your apartment building, and there's a picture of him on the wall. So it was such a wonderful way to keep reconnected with uh, John James. He's actually a kind person. You know, we need to be seeing that our, our older activists, you see, you know, people give us so much from our communities, they age. You know, are able to you know end their lives with dignity and comfortable circumstances. So my my hat's off to you for that great accomplishment. Uh, would you like to tell us a little bit about sure. starting that uh, how you had the vision? What, what gave you that your first of all? What was the very hard to see that? Uh, there's one person right there, <laughs> Jim Ferrat. Um, being a member of Gay Liberation Front, uh, being one of the my younger ones. Did I say that? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you were. <laughs> Most of my peers at that point were older than me. Uh, and they're now in their 70s, some in their 80s. And being among them when I was young, they allowed me to form gay youth. And being, being a leader in that regard, because we were just beginning to learn of the hardships of gay youth. People being thrown on the streets, people being bullied, uh, people committing suicide. We were dealing with those issues in 1969. Well, here it is, all the people that helped me do that, and they're all now seniors. So 
And it, basically, they are the first out generation. That first out generation, for the most part, to be out, they had to give up two things, which are very important when you become a senior. First thing, for the most part, if you were out in the 1950s or early 1960s, you, for the most part, lost the support of your family. In those days, you couldn't get a good job with, with what would become a 401k. Let, if you didn't know this, let me tell you and remind you, you couldn't be a lawyer because look, the Bar Association wouldn't pass you. You couldn't be a doctor if you were an out gay person. Um, you couldn't be a garbage collector in California. I mean, these are the kind of issues we had. So those people who did this work are incredible pioneers. And now that they're getting on in years, a lot of them can't afford to live in the very gamerhoods that they created. So we have our own seniors being tossed out of the community they created and have to live in some places that are not gay friendly. So the African American community creates senior affordable housing for their community. So does the Jewish community, so does the Catholic community, so does Presbyterian homes. I'm sure you've all heard of them. They're one of the largest. 